All right, we're going to do a study today on does the Bible teach that God is the soul? All right, now I made a statement a little while ago, and I'm not always clear in the way I try to say things. I'm not trying to deceive anybody. It's just I'm, I'm just a, a hillbilly, and sometimes I don't really say things as clearly as I should. Kind of like the Apostle Paul, a little bit rude in, in my speech sometimes. My speech can be a little bit contemptible. And I said I cannot show one verse of Scripture that says God is the soul. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't any scriptures in there, because I'm going to show you today that there are. Um, what it meant was, and I didn't get this out clearly, I haven't done the study yet. All right? I, can, I, I have done the study on where the, the term Trinity comes from. It comes from, it was invented by Tertullian back in the second century and was made official Catholic doctrine in the fourth century. The councils of Nicaea and Constantinople, if I remember correctly. All right? Um, that's where it came from. An early church father who was quite heretical in some of the other stuff he believed, and then it was made into official Catholic doctrine, and then they debated it back and forth, and they still debate it back and forth. What is exactly, how does the Trinity work out, and whatever else. Um, Trinity is not a Bible word, okay? Never has been, nor will it ever be, at least in the King James Bible. Can't speak for the other ones. Um, but does the Bible teach because they'll say, people say, nowhere in the Bible does God refer to himself as a soul. Nowhere. Because what the Bible teaches about the Godhead, there are three in one. Man is created in the image of God. Man has a body, soul, spirit. Three in one. You aren't looking at me right now and seeing body here, soul here, spirit there. Or this way, and you know, we all join together in three interlocking circles that form a trichatra. Uh, no, that's not true of me, and it's not true of God either. All right? God consists of the soul, which is the Father, Jesus Christ, which is the body, and the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit. It all works out perfectly. All right? But they say, you can't prove one verse of Scripture that where God refers to himself, God the Father refers to himself as the soul. We're going to see about that. Leviticus chapter 26. And this is by no means an exhaustive study. I'm just you know, just uh, going to show you a bunch of them here that the Lord showed me. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11 through 13. It says here, And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk, walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Talking about God the Father. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen, and I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. God the Father is dealing with the Jews in the Old Testament. And right there he says in verse 11, And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. Now, the Catholic Trinity people, they try to say that there are three different gods, each one with body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit. So, apparently, you have Jesus Christ in heaven, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and and the word was God, you know, John chapter 1. Jesus Christ is in heaven, and his soul is separate from God the Father's soul. So, when he says here in verse 11, according to a Trinity believer, my soul shall not abhor you, he's saying my soul as opposed to the soul of Jesus and as opposed to the soul of the Holy Ghost. It's weird. So you have three gods, each with their own body, soul, and spirit. That's not what the Bible teaches. When God the Father is speaking in this passage. He says, My soul shall not abhor you. He's speaking collectively, you know, let us create man in our image, speaking of the Godhead. See, the difference between the Godhead and man is the Godhead has body, soul, and spirit, but they can split off and still function apart from each other. We can't do that as man. And you say, well, how does that whole thing work out? Well, that's the mystery of godliness, you see. I don't understand how you can split body, soul, spirit up, and they can function independently, but yet be connected and understanding things. But that's what the Bible teaches. There aren't three different gods. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit appears nowhere in Scripture. Let's go to the next one. Isaiah 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10 is where we're going to go. 
verse 10 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of your, our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Who are they sacrificing to? God the Father. Saith the Lord, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he-goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hands to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. Look at the unique wording there in verse 14. My soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. You see? Now, if you want to believe in the Trinity thing, that he's a separate God or something, and he has his own body, soul, spirit, and he's over that way, and was it not a trouble to the Lord Jesus Christ? Was it not a trouble? Did it not grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Or were they just kind of off doing their own thing someplace in some other place in heaven or maybe whatever else? And it really didn't grieve them so much. And God the Father is the only one that's really upset about this. Uh, no. He's saying, you've grieved there. My soul hateth. Not just grieved. It's, his soul hates it. They are a trouble unto me. God the Father is dealing with the nation of Israel there in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ has not yet been made manifest as far as being the Messiah to the Jewish people. He's there. He appears as the priest of the order of Melchizedek. You can read Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, I think it is. Talks about that. He was there in a pre-incarnate form in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he says, Didn't we cast three men in there? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? But I see four men. And the appearance of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. So Jesus Christ had a physical body all throughout the Old Testament. Now, he comes down and he's born of Mary and, and everything else, so his physical body changes. He takes on a different type of physical body. And, you know, you get into some real deep stuff there. But Jesus Christ appears all throughout the Old Testament many times in a physical body. But he had a soul. And the soul was God the Father. That's why here in this passage, he says, my soul hates this, my soul hateth, they are a trouble unto me, the Godhead. They're all troubled by it. You see, Isaiah chapter 42, go to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. His soul delights? Hmm. Delighteth? I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Who is this talking about? It's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Look at this. Behold mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. Why did Jesus Christ say that there is none good? But God? You mean to tell me that any sinner down here, that any sinful man, that God could really rightly say, my soul delights in that guy? Well, maybe. A little bit. But not in the sense of him perfectly keeping the law. Perfectly not sinning. Jesus Christ is the one that fulfilled this scripture here. I'll show you a little bit later about that in the New Testament tie-in there. But look at this. I have put my spirit upon him. What happened in Matthew chapter 3 when Jesus is baptized? This is my beloved son. Voice from heaven. The soul speaks from heaven to Jesus Christ, the body there being baptized. And what happens? The Holy Spirit descends from heaven like a dove, not as a dove, like a dove comes down. Hmm. I, will, I have put my spirit upon him. Interesting. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Did it happen? Hello. I'm a Gentile. Saved Gentile. Born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Interesting. 
He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. A lot of very deep prophecies there about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. But you have soul and spirit mentioned in verse 1. Where's the body at? Well, that would be mine elect. Body, soul, spirit. God was manifest, manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Hmm, interesting. Next, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 5. We'll be getting back to Isaiah chapter 42 here, the prophecy about Jesus Christ, the Messiah there. We'll get back to that in just a little bit. <clears throat> I'll show you a couple other ones here. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 4. Therefore I said, Surely these are poor, they are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. Okay, I'm looking here. Okay. And I okay, I put this one in there. Who's it talking about? Again, it's talking about the Jewish people. They're foolish, they don't know the way of their God. God the Father, it's talking about here in context. <clears throat> Verse nine. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Uh, well, who was the covenant between there? The Mosaic covenant was between the nation of Israel and God the Father. Their Messiah hadn't come yet. Jesus Christ appeared many times throughout the Old Testament in a pre-incarnate form. That's true. You can prove that from Scripture. But he wasn't there dealing with the nation of Israel yet. It was God the Father that was dealing with him. But it doesn't say, shall not my body, shall not I, shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this. No scriptures that say that God the Father is the soul. There's another one. Go to verse 29 here in Jeremiah chapter 5. Again, you see a similar thing here as verse 9. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? It's easy again. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. For thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees, and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy, oppress she is holy oppression uh, in the midst of her. As a fountain casteth out her waters, so she casteth out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate and a land not inhabited. Who departed from Israel? God the Father. Hmm. They broke the Mosaic Covenant. The Abrahamic Covenant's there. It's an everlasting covenant. But the Mosaic Covenant had conditions on it. And part of those conditions was the Ten Commandments. Again, you can watch my study on the whole thing of the covenants and, and things there. You know, the Mosaic Covenant was one that the Jews broke. And God actually makes a new covenant. And it wasn't the New Testament. Again, that's a whole other thing. I did a big study on that not long ago. The New Testament is not the New Covenant. The New Covenant comes in, in the time of Jacob's trouble, going into the Millennial Kingdom. That's when it comes in. So the real problem with the Jewish people, of course they've rejected Jesus Christ, the body, but they've also rejected God the Father, the soul. Go to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 9. And of course they don't have the Holy Spirit of God either. It's interesting because the disciples of John the Baptist, when they meet the Christians there in the book of Acts, they're saying, you know, I think Peter it was, and he says, you know, have you received the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, the gift of the Holy Ghost? And they said, we don't even know if there is a Holy Ghost, <laughs> you know. Very true of a lot of Jews today that are lost. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 9. Shall I not visit them for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? 
Hmm. Again, no clear scriptures that prove that God is the soul. Well, that's kind of a problem. Go next to uh, Zechariah chapter 11. Show you another one here. Zechariah chapter 11, verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> okay, it says here, for I, will be, for I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. But lo, I will deliver the men, every one, into his neighbor's hand, and into the hand of the king, and they shall smite the land. And out of their hand I will not deliver them. And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Isn't that interesting? God's soul, God the Father, abhorred them, and what did they do? Their soul abhorred him. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, next we're going to go to the New Testament now, Matthew chapter 12. We'll look at a bunch more here in the New Testament. Our God the Father is called a soul. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14 through 21. Okay, it says here, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 through 4, which we read earlier, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his, names, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Jesus fulfilled that. And you say, but I, you know, Jesus preached in the streets, and I don't understand what this is talking about. It's talking about early on in his ministry. He gives them the chance to accept him as their king, as their Messiah. That opportunity is there. They reject him, and then things change a bit there. Jesus came and offered everything the first time. But he left it up to the Jews. They rejected him, and he said, okay, there's certain parts about this, you know, some of the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. There are certain things that are going to, have to be put off for a while now because you've rejected me as your king. You've rejected me as your Messiah. Yeah. But look at that verse there, verse 18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. You know, actually let's go to verse 17 for a minute. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying. So it's saying this is fulfilled. Jesus Christ fulfilled this prophecy. So you can't go back to Isaiah chapter 42 and say, well that's talking about somebody else. The mind elect is talking about somebody else. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And when you look at the thing, I mean, look at it. Verse 18. Behold my servant, Jesus, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. God the Father, the soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Jesus is the body. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. It's right there. You want a, a real good proof text for the Godhead, the biblical Godhead? You're looking at it right there. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. My beloved, my chosen, Jesus, my soul, God the Father, my spirit, the Holy Ghost. Three in one. Oh no, it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a... A, another god there you know you have three gods and and two gods or well one god is in heaven the other's kind of in between there the god the bird there you know and uh the third god down there he's jesus christ god the son no it's a one god composed of body soul spirit that's what the bible teaches it's not god in three persons there's no scripture for that it's definitely not trinity 
Anybody that clings to that word is lost. I'm telling you right now. I mean, using it, I can understand. I've used it in the past. A lot of great men of God have used it, right? But when you pin them right down, if they're teaching this Catholic Trinity stuff and there's, and they, I'll defend the Trinity, well, then you're just like a Catholic, all right? I mean, it's an indefensible position. It's just insane. I will defend the Trinity. It's not a Bible word. And the whole concept, you, you study Catholicism, you study what they're teaching, their whole concept is far into the pages of Scripture. It's a pagan idol. But let's continue. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 38 through 39. Okay, it says here, verse 38, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Oh, wait a second here. Um, my soul, verse 38, is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Down here, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He talks about the soul in verse 38 and verse 39. He says, not my will, but thine be done, essentially. I mean, could it be that the soul there, the father is saying, oh, man, this is going to be really horrible. I don't want this thing and, and whatever else. And this, this, oh, looking at his son there, he's going to die a terrible death. Do you think God the father is worried about the pain that Jesus Christ is going to feel? He's not going to feel it. You come, a bunch of you Trinity Catholic people, Papists, you come and you, you beat me to death, my soul wouldn't going to feel that. It's not going to. You're going to get rid of this flesh, this fleshly body, and it's going to be painful. Sure. See? Jesus Christ is going to be feeling some horrible pain coming up. And God the Father, the soul, says, oh boy, this is going to be bad. But Jesus Christ, as the Son, says, whatever your will is, to the soul, God the Father. See, how does all that stuff work out? That's kind of confusing. It's called the mystery of godliness, right? But there's enough given in Scripture that you can see how it works. Body, soul, spirit, these three are one. Those three can separate. You'll see that all throughout the Bible. Those three can be separate. They can function independently of each other. But they don't, when Jesus leaves, when he's not part of the Godhead there, as far as, you know, when he's, dying on the cross and things, he doesn't have his own soul and spirit separate from God the Father and the Holy Ghost. No. It's the three of them together. But then the soul leaves, the spirit leaves. Jesus Christ died on the cross. God the Father didn't die on the cross. The soul, or excuse me, the spirit, the Holy Spirit did not die on the cross. He gave up the ghost. You remember? What does he say about the Father? Why hast thou forsaken me? We'll never have perfect understanding until we get to be with the Lord, sure. But that doesn't give you the right to add a bunch of things to Scripture and say, God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, Trinity, all this other pagan nonsense. Next, let's go to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 34 through 36. And saith unto him, my, unto them, excuse me, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on, on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Again, you see the similar kind of thing that's going on in Matthew chapter 26. Same kind of a deal there. Same, just another account of that event taking place. So you say, well, if Jesus is, is God the Father, you know, if they're, if they're all one, you know, in other words, um, and, and, you know, I have, I've said in the past here, I need to correct something, and that is that people, if they're hearing me say Jesus is God the Father, I'm not saying that there's no separation between the two. Body, soul, spirit can separate, certainly. 
I'm not saying that there is no God the Father, it's all just Jesus. No, that's, you can clearly debunk that from Scripture, the Pentecostal oneness thing or whatever else. Certainly, that's heresy. But what I am saying is, Jesus is the body, God is the soul. I think I've been proving that, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit. And I mean, you know, you can keep going on and on with this thing. We'll show you another one here, John chapter 12. But this is one that's come up. People say, could you give me one verse of Scripture where it says God is the soul? Well, I've been giving you lots of them. John chapter 12, verse 27 through 28. Again, another account of this same thing. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? My soul is troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Is God the Father the soul of the Godhead? Uh, yes. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit will bear witness and say, yeah, it's right there. My soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father? Who's he talking to? My soul is troubled. What shall I, the Son, say to the soul? Father. Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I into this hour, came I unto this hour, excuse me. Verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The Lord there. And of course, I do believe that the, you know, the, the name of Jesus is greater than any name out there, certainly. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And that will certainly happen. No clear scriptures, huh? Well, there's lots of them. Hebrews chapter 10. Final one here that we're going to look at. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Interesting that you have God the Father dealing with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Then Jesus Christ, when He's on the earth, He's making clear references that he is talking to his father, the soul, there. His soul is being grieved. His soul is, is upset about things that are going on. And he's saying, you know, the Lord's talking to the father, the soul, there. And then the Lord Jesus Christ is dealing with his church now in what many call the church age and, and things, the, the time of the body of Christ, all right, where both Jews and Gentiles are saved. We're all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Certainly that's there. But what happens at the catching away? Well, the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled there. Boom. Over. Now God starts to deal with the nation of Israel again. Did you hear me? I said uh, God starts to deal with the nation of Israel again. Only there's a new element there, and that is there's an element of faith in Jesus Christ. There's faith in works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Faith in Jesus, and you better not take that mark of the beast. No matter what stupid heretics say that you can take it and later cut your hand off or something like that. Um, that's ridiculous. That's what lost people say, by the way. Lost people have this funny notion that, you know, you can just kind of mess around and sin all your life and right at the end, just kind of, okay, I'm done now. Okay, I'm in. You know, kind of like you can fool God. I remember growing up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and they had the Amish that uh, they didn't have telephones. They don't believe in telephones in the house. They had these little telephone booths out in the field someplace. You look way down in the field and there's this little, looks like a little, you know, miniature one person shed or something little telephone booth you know you can't have it in your home that's evil but you can put it out in the field and god doesn't know it's there all right god overlooks it he just well i don't see a phone in their house they're holy they're going to go to heaven <laughs> it's ridiculous but see that's what lost people do they'll say i want to hold on to this little sin thing here and i'm just going to kind of tuck it away in my pocket and say i, I don't know anything about that sin i know you know and, and they think God is so, you know, stupid and gullible that he just goes, well, I guess that they're fine. I don't know, you know. It's crazy. But God is dealing with the nation of Israel in the time of Jacob's trouble. God the Father. Jesus Christ is being preached, but it goes back to God the Father dealing with that nation. Why? Because he made a covenant with them back under Moses. Moses shows up in the time of Jacob's trouble, one of the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. 
And now God starts to deal with that nation of Israel again through the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. And now they're there preaching Jesus Christ. So there's faith, but there's also keeping the commandments, which is part of the first covenant that God made with Moses. Again, watch my study on that. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Faith of Jesus and keeping the commandments. It's right there. But check this out. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. There are faith in the time of Jacob's trouble? Mm -hmm. Certainly. But if any man draw back, leaves the Lord, draws back and he goes and he takes the mark of the beast, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. What's the time of Jacob's trouble? God is dealing with the nation of Israel. He's brought them back to their land in unbelief. You, know, you read about back in the book of Ezekiel. He's brought them back in their unbelief. He's going to, you know, he remembers the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's, he's brought them back to their land and he's dealing with them and he's given them signs and wonders, which is the whole book of Revelation. That's what it's all about. So God's dealing with the Jewish people. So he's just, they have eternal security because eternal security is there in every dispensation. Right? Whatever. <laughs> you know, oh, it, it's just all, it all works out. Well, if you're lost, you know, you can make make a mess of the whole Bible. Just say it all teaches the same thing. Gospel's always been the same. Eternal security's always been the same. Everything else. Heresy. Absolute total heresy. And look at the verse. Now the just shall live by faith. Is that true for us today? Yeah. But if any man draw back, you mess around, in other words. You get messed up in sin as a Christian, which happens a lot. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. Huh? But today, we're part of the body of Christ. We have eternal security today. How does this work for a Christian? If everything in the scriptures is all for us, well, how's that work? And a lot of other verses in the book of Hebrews, too. You have all kinds of problems trying to make the book of Hebrews for Christians. I thought that there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Then why would you write a book called Hebrews? Unless it's for a Jew in the time of uh, Jacob, you know, Israel, Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. See, the Bible works out when you rightly divide it. When you put things in the proper context and whatever else. God the Father comes back on the scene. See, right now there's a mediator between God the Father and man, and that is Jesus Christ. We have that mediator there. I am part of the body of Christ. I have a personal relationship with with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But in that time that's coming in the future, they don't have that same kind of relationship. They don't have eternal security. They're not sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about that. They don't have that. You take that mark of the beast, you know, take the mark, worship the beast and his image, boom, you're in hell. According to Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 11. That's the way it is. But in that time, the soul, God the Father, is specifically dealing with that nation of Israel over there. So you want some scriptures proving that God the Father is the soul of the Godhead? Here's a whole list of them. Just gave them to you. Brethren, we need to be people of the book. King James Bible believers. So I'm a King James Bible believer, but I'll defend the doctrine of the Trinity. Then you're not a Bible believing Christian. You say, well, yes, I am. I'm, I'm a Bible believer. I've, I've known other people. Other people aren't the standard. That's the standard. Well, yeah, but uh, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman used the word Trinity. Then he was wrong. The Bible's right. Ruckman was wrong. Well, uh, Brian, you used to use the word Trinity, too. Then I was wrong. And the Bible is right. Well, my pastor is a good man. He's a godly man, and he says Trinity. Then your pastor's wrong, and the Bible's right. Do you understand? Well, I can prove church councils. Throw your church councils out. Throw your confessions of faith out. Your catechisms. Your book of discipline. Your what? It's the book. It's the book. 
And you say, well, yeah, but there are ver words that, that we use and that you use and things and whatever that don't specifically appear in the Bible. Okay, I, I understand that there are certain things in our language that we would use and whatever else, but we're not talking about just some kind of a minor thing. We're talking about a title for God himself. The Bible's very specific. The name is Godhead. If God wanted to be called Trinity, he would have put it in his book. It isn't some kind of a small little thing and whatever else, the word rapture or something like that. Rapture as a word versus the real one of being caught up, you know, that's not as important as a title for God himself. And when you actually stand back and you look at what this Trinity teaching is versus what the Bible teaches about the Godhead, you start to realize it's a very, very serious sin to say the word Trinity. It said in ignorance a lot. It said many times in ignorance. But when you actually get to know what is going on with this debate versus you know, Trinity versus Godhead, there is no option. You need to drop that word Trinity from your vocabulary. Don't call God by the name of a false pagan idol. Again, you know, oh, you're, you're such a nut. Okay, just, you know, just go to Google Images, right? Any kind of a search engine out there and just type in, in images, it'll come up with pictures, type in Holy Trinity or just Trinity and see what you come up with. See what you come up with. All right? So that is going to be it. I'm going to be coming out with a definitive study on the uh, Bible doctrine of the Godhead. I'm going to be um, sharing a lot of insights from other brothers and sisters in the Lord, um, members of the body of Christ. Uh, we're going to be working on it as a kind of cooperative type of a thing over at our Patreon page. Um, you know, I can, I can have comments over there. I can police the comments over there a lot better than I can here on YouTube where just anybody can get in and post multiple, have multiple channels and just be getting in all the time. I can't control that stuff. People are putting links to heretical stuff, putting profanity down in the comments section. Again, that's why I had to close the comments because it was just getting so bad, so vile. People were just coming in, putting things in that were just dirty and horrible um, on purpose. I'm not always on the computer. I don't have a cell phone, so I'm not always checking what people are doing. There's many times I'll be away from the internet for eight or ten hours, you know, at a time, and I come back even longer than that. I'll be away all day, you know, working and things and and um, I'll come back and people are saying, brother, you know, you know, they, all this stuff has been posted in your most recent video and whatever in the comments. And I just got tired of it. And I said, you know what? I hate to do this, but I got to shut the comments, you know, on my channel here on YouTube. I didn't have a choice. Um, it's something I prayed about. I mean, 10 years I had them open. And I just finally had to get to a point where I said, you know what? I don't want people dealing with me. All right, and making this an issue of what is Brian Denlinger saying and I have to follow Brian Denlinger's teachings. Or... It's the book. You get done watching this video and you disagree with me, pray about it. Ask the Lord to show you the truth. All right? If you, you know, most of my enemies don't even watch my videos. Let's just face it, they don't even watch anything I say. Uh, they answer the matter before they hear it. But if you've actually watched the video and you have some objections and whatever else, you can write to me in the mail. I mean, write me a letter. I get letters all the time. Here's a whole stack of letters just from the other day, you know. A um, whole bunch of letters. People sending me things. Um, you know, there's more of them. I got stacks of letters around, you know. And a lot of it's just thank you for your ministry and whatever else. Um, but if I get a letter in the mail that says, hey, here's some things I'd like you to address. Boom, 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 boom. I'll make a video on it. I'll show the letter. If you want me to show the letter, I'll give your name out. If you want me to do that, if not, just say don't share my letter or don't share my name, and I won't do it. You can get in touch with me. People pretend that they can't. Well, it's because most people are too lazy to use anything but email. They can just shoot a bunch of things and shoot a bunch of, you know, uh, articles and things, you know, online articles, and just put a bunch of links in it and bomb me with that stuff, and then I'm supposed to spend my time answering all that stuff. I'm too busy. I have a lot of things to do, all right? I'm just one man, you know? I'm not three different men, you know, like a Trinity thing. <laughs> so let's be people of the book. 
Don't claim to, I mean, if you're, if you, if you say, well, I, I'm going to keep the Trinity thing, okay, then don't call yourself a King James Bible-believing Christian. It's just as simple as that. Uh, leave the Bible-believing movement. Um, don't try to infiltrate. Don't try to get in here with your created terms and whatever else that you look at the foundation, it goes back to uh, Catholicism. Don't bring that stuff around, right? So, but if you stand for the King James Bible, then work hard at getting rid of this pagan concept out of your terminology. Um, it's not the same thing as somebody calling, you know, the scriptures the Bible or something. Uh, it's not a title for God, all right? Trinity is supposed to be a title for God, but when you actually study what the Trinity is and what it's all about, it's a false, you know, three gods. And that's what they teach. And they will always reject it. We don't teach three different gods. Yes, you do. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's three different gods. It's exactly what they believe. It's deception. So that's enough of that. Like I said, I'm going to be doing a definitive study in the future, going over a lot of scriptures, um, showing verses that talk about the Godhead. And then I'm going to be doing another study debunking the Catholic Trinity, pagan Trinity people's objections to the biblical Godhead. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.